Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you. If you're a first time listener, welcome to the conversation. We please ask you to subscribe so you can get all the latest updates and also play along, contribute to the conversation. Now, if you are a returning listener, I hope we'll get off of this um, bandwagon here shortly, but we recently found out that the podcast has cracked the top 10 fastest growing podcasts in the marketplace, which is all dependent and thanks to you. And then also thanks to our great guests. And we have another one of those today. But before we get there, um, we want to just get rid of the house cleaning stuff. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're on a platform that you don't love, you certainly can find us on any and all um, podcast platforms, there are over 20 of them. You can find us on social media, and then you can also find us on the show website with profiles of all of our guests, information, both on guests, you know, previous and future. And so it's exciting. All right. So housekeeping out of the way, I'm still hoping to find some penguins in Antarctica to, um, to talk to, but they're not there yet. But I've got a great guest today that continues on with our great um, level of guests. And before we announce her, um, she really brings an interesting topic to bear. Uh, we might get a little adult today. So if you got little ones listening in the car, you might want to um, think about listening to this at a different time. Yes. Uh, we, we generally try to keep things at a high level, but today's some interesting stuff. So our guest is a writer and author that's doing some amazing things in helping people with dating and in relationships, marriages, and what have you on working with intimacy and keeping those relationships, intimacy, and how to, and to develop that deeper, um, even to the level of some eroticism and some of the things that people do. And then also having people have confidence in dating. So, you know, one of the biggest decisions we make in our lives is who do we spend the rest of our time with and who we're connected with. So today I'd like to introduce you to um, Valerie ba Baber. Oh gosh, if I could talk, Valerie Baber. Valerie, yeah. wake, wake, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rex. Thanks for having me. And yes, we are going to get a little sexy today, but I like to think that eroticism and, and sexuality and intimacy and everything under that umbrella doesn't necessarily have to be lowbrow, you no. know? <laughs> so, so if people think, if people think, oh, we're talking erotica and relationships, and so it's going to be raunchy, they might, might be let down. I mean, it's, it'll be fun. This will be a fun conversation. Okay. But, well, um, it doesn't have to involve raunch for sure. We always talk about two types of class around my hut. There's first and none. So we'll try to keep it uh, in a first class presentation. But we've got some fun things to talk about. All right. Definitely. So Valerie, uh, you're at this point, we're doing all this writing and coaching and consulting and helping people um, change their perspectives. But before we go there, uh, real quick, how do people get in contact with you? So if they're listening in front of their computer on a mobile device and they want to dial you up, how do they find you? Right. So I try to keep it as simple as possible for everyone. I am across the board at Valerie Baber. So um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Valerie Baber. Uh, and that's spelled I-E, like the Amy Winehouse song. And Baber is B-A-B-E-R, Babe with an attitude, Baber. So. <laughs> and, and that includes your website, correct? And that's my website too, www.valeriebaber.com. Um, that's my Gmail, Valerie Baber at Gmail. So it's, wow. it's simple. You know the name, you know how to find me. Well, if only you could figure out how to get the phone number for that in letters. But anyway. <laughs> all right. So fantastic. So uh, life is like a series of hops. We all hop from one thing to another to get across the stream. And sometimes we get wet. Sometimes we have to retrace our steps and find a different way. So dial in a little bit of your background and who Valerie is. So we like to go back and kind of understand a little bit about your upbringing, you know, where'd you grow up, siblings, parents, you know, things you, you know, were involved with as, as a kid growing up, a little bit about your education, and then some hops to get you where you are today. So we'll go in chronological order. Okay. Yes. Take it away. You know, now we don't have to have diaper steps and stuff. Well, I started crawl, you know, crawling at nine months. But yeah, bring us up to date on how your background sort of influenced who you are today. 
Okay. Well, um, I was uh, born in Virginia. My dad was in the military, um, Southern, Southern family, um, very, um, very religious and um, just a typical American Southern family. Uh, raised in Oklahoma for 15 years. And, um, you know, no offense to the people who love Oklahoma, but I knew when I was very young that I had to get the hay out of there as quickly as I could. Um, okay. But <laughs> so, so I did, I went to California to be a star. Um, I actually did a little bit of that. Um, and, and then when my, um, t- uh, my time in California uh, came to an end when my career with uh, Playboy uh, TV um, came to an end. I went and explored a little bit more. I moved to the East Coast. I moved to the UK where I, I continued my education a little late in the game, but I got it nonetheless. And then I came back to California where I'm working as a coach. So uh, when I when I left Oklahoma to, to go to California, um, I, I had no intention of, uh, let's say being naked on the internet. <laughs> you know, I was, I was raised Christian, um, you know, Christian and pretty strict and, um, very shy, very conservative. Uh, and that is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a serious actress, but I also desperately needed to feed myself. I do not come from a supportive family. They were not particularly loving or affectionate. They had no money. Uh, they had no contacts. They had, um, very little privilege beyond okay. perhaps, you know, race. Okay. So, so really a struggle. So okay. really a struggle for me. I was completely on my own. I don't even have siblings. Um, wow. and, and I was just like, I was in dire straits. I needed to pay the bills. I needed to pay really big bills because I chose to live in Los Angeles. You know, I sure. wanted, I wanted to, to massively change my, my life. No. So I thought you've got radical changes and, and, there I was in Los Angeles. So, so let um, me ask you this question. Cause I, I have friends whose kids have gone out to LA and, you know, try to jump into the star train and all that stuff. And so one of my friends, um, his um, daughter went out to do that and his, and her siblings called her rather than an actress, they called her restaurant worker. So um, you see a lot of people have to yeah. do things that they weren't planning on doing when they decide to go, to go off and chase that type of a career. So wow. sounds like you kind of had to do some of the things that you weren't planning on to uh, make it work. Yeah, well, definitely. And I mean, I really, my, my other option would have been to have been a restaurant worker in Oklahoma, you know, <laughs> so if you're going to be a restaurant worker anywhere, uh, you might as well do it in a, in, a, in a city where people make dreams come true. Sure. Um, you never know who you're going to meet here. Uh, there, you probably know who it is, and sure. they're probably not going to make, make that much of a difference in in your life experience. But um, yeah, so one of those things that happened that I didn't expect to happen was a um, an invitation to come and work for Playboy TV. Okay. And at first, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't be, I can't do this. I can't be around like se- that much sexuality, and I don't know, I don't know if I could be naked on camera. But um, but it it was Playboy, and that is a that's a massive name, and I think. If there's any sort of, um, le- if there's any erotica that even conservative people respect, it's Playboy. It's Hugh mm-hmm. Hefner. He's the exception. Sure. Um, massive part of pop culture. And I'm really, I'm now looking back on it, I'm very fortunate to have caught the tail end of that, to have been to the Playboy Mansion, to, to understand um, what that's like. But I started working as a, um, a journalist, a sex journalist for Playboy TV. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they sent me an on-camera journalist. So they sent me, um, they put me on planes and sent me around talking to people about their, I guess, alternative adult lifestyles or their relationships. So I went to Holland, I went to Nebraska. I was, I was in all kinds of, uh, all kinds of places in between, talked to all kinds of people. And I became really, it was a fab, it was such a fun job, fun job, even though it was kind of I had some inner conflict with it. Um, I also had a lot of fun from it and I learned about it. And I, I started to realize we as a society are really conflicted. Like we have, we have such, we're deeply fascinated by sex. We're driven by sex. It's such a massive force in our lives, mm-hmm. but we also hate it and we're scared of it and we don't know how to address it. And, and we do it, but we hide it. And then we hate ourselves for it. And we're all trying to pretend that we're not doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. What's going on here? Like this right. is, we need a healthier perspective about sexuality and relationships. And so that sort of sparked the flame of, um, 
that, yeah, that created my interest. And, and as you said, you know, I did, I did, um, that was a part-time job. And so I had to do other things, um, to, to be able to pay those LA size bills on my own as a 21 year old. Um, mm-hmm. and, and some of that was like club work, bar work. And I'm going to say that the theme that I, I became interested in working while I was working with Playboy, it carried into my bar work. So okay. I was like, I was essentially a therapist um, with a cocktail in hand, cocktail sure. therapy, you know, and, and people would come up to me and tell me all about their relationships and what was going wrong. And I did this for quite some time. And I learned about, I learned the scripts in relationships. And sure. um, should I tell you, should I share what, what it is that I, I kept hearing over and over and over again? Let's go there. Let's go there. But before we start now, I'm looking back on your journalism days with Playboy. I'm assuming, you know, and this is dealing with your conflict a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming they didn't dress you in an overcoat when you were doing on-camera interviews, right? Um, I, you know, it depends. I actually, they had me dress in different costumes <laughs> or different uh, apparel, uh, uh, depending on on what I was doing. So for instance, I went to a, a fetish ball, one of the world's largest fetish balls in Rotterdam. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they had me dressed in a latex uh, skirt and top. Okay. I, I um, went and spoke with some lawyers about a young woman in, um, in the Midwest who had a, at the time, uh, not everybody had uh, their own website, topless website. Sure. You know, and so um, <clears throat> she had this topless website, which was not illegal, but she was taking pictures in public public places, which was illegal. illegal. Sure. So there was a conflict there. So I went and talked to these lawyers and I think that I was wearing like a white button down blouse. Sure. Um, but yes, there were also moments where I was wearing less. Sure. I mean, it's Playboy. So Yeah, it's Playboy. And that's the whole brand and that kind of stuff. So did that impact your, the performance on your work based on, you know, sort of conflict with that stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. And I also did some, at the time, Cinemax was a thing. So I did some after dark um, acting, if you can call it that. Sure. Um, uh, I, it did impact the performance of my work. I, I still had fun with my work. I learned, a, I learned a lot. Um, there were aspects that I enjoyed. Um, there were aspects that I didn't, and it, and it was hard for me to really, really feel bold and proud and empowered when mm-hmm. I was also trying, when I was trying to deliver news while unbuttoning my blouse, <laughs> you know? sure. um, or when I was standing in front of the camera being totally vulnerable and perhaps some would say objectified, um, you know, trying it, there were there were moments where yeah it, it was definitely different and I and I would have performed differently if I were fully clothed if I were on like ABC or NBC or Channel Five or you know whatever right. I would perform differently one hundred percent yes so let me ask you this question because it's something that I think all women deal with and men don't really understand it um, and especially in the industry that you were working in um, was it hard to deal with the feelings of being objectified on a, on a pretty well regular basis? You know, there, there were mixed feelings that went with that. And, and so, yeah, there is this, like, why do I have to be naked to get, to be paid? Why do I have to be, why do I have to look uh, good without clothes to be considered worthy to be a woman, to be on anyone's radar as, you know, a valuable female? Sure. Like, this this is not good for me. And then on the other hand, I was thinking not everybody can pull this off. And one day I'm going to be sitting in my rocking chair, you know, wrinkled, and I'm going to look back on these videos or these photos and go, "Dang, girl, yes, you get it. You go like that." that that's awesome that you were that person and Mm -hmm. not everyone is, is brave enough to do that. And you took chances and you looked good doing it. So there was a very much a back and forth. You know, some people, some women would say that's empowering. Um, So for instance, I knew a, um, I knew a, I had a friend who uh, was paying her way through law school as a nude dancer. Mm -hmm. And she thought 
it was, she felt very strengthened by that. She loved knowing that she could do that um, uh, on her own, you know, her own way. She yep. could make the money she wanted to make and she was going to be a lawyer after that. And that made her feel very strong. Doing those kinds of things, I, I really, they created some demons for me. Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, they liberated me because I was able to live a, a really interesting, fabulous life. I okay. had free time to do things that were meaningful to me. I wasn't a slave to the cubicle. I wasn't a slave to, you know, boss man. I didn't have to give up my Monday through Friday. I only have Saturday and Sunday for myself, but really I don't have those because I have to do the dishes and, and take sure. the dry cleaning and did it, did it, you know, right. I actually got to live because of the choices that I made. So I was um, both liberated and held back by, I guess, what we could call objectification. Yeah, and I, and I still have. Okay, some, you know? now, no judgment here. Just a quick question on this. Just, you know, looking back over this, fast forward to the future, you have a 19-year-old daughter, 20-year-old daughter. Um, would it be something that you would encourage or support, or would you say, eh, maybe that's not for you? Well, so I... I'm going to tell you this, if I did not come from the socioeconomic class that I came from, if I did not come from the family that I came from, that was you know, very much, I don't know where they were. They were mm -hmm. somewhere else. Okay. You know, I would have made, I, I feel, I, I believe that I would have made different choices, Okay. but you only have what you have to work with. I exactly. did the best I could with what I had. Right. And I know that I, I'm a, I don't have children, but if I were a mother, I would do whatever it took to provide my child or children with whatever opportunities they wanted so that they didn't feel that they had to do something that wounded them or could ne negatively impact their future. Right. Because okay? so, I'm assuming going forward, you know, and because of your experiences in that industry, you're still struggling with some of that, you know, kind of stuff, right? Is that true? I will always struggle with it. I will always struggle with it because of the way society struggles with their own sexuality, with their own fear of, you know, a woman, uh, you know, capitalizing off of her body or a woman feeling free with her body or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so, so people are scared of this. People you know, have this nature versus religion or whatever it is, nature versus culture. They haven't dealt through their own garbage. So they project garbage onto me and other men and women like me. Okay. And so I deal with that because they're struggling with it. And part of what I do is try to help people overcome those struggles so that, you know, they can't, so that they can be liberated from their, you know, that nastiness that lives inside of them. They don't have to look at somebody like me and go, oh no, she's bad. They can actually find the truth. <laughs> they okay. can see beyond that and they can feel more comfortable with me and themselves. And once they feel more comfortable with themselves, they can have more successful relationships. They can have better sex, all of it. Sure. So, so yeah. So I would, for my child, provide them with, would do whatever it takes to provide them with the opportunities that they wanted. Now, if I had a daughter that said this, this is what I want to do. This is for me, for whatever reason, I would make sure that she has a safe place to go. Uh -huh. I would make sure that she knows that she is supported and loved. And if she wants to go further with it, then I'm going to provide her with as many resources as I can to make sure she does it in the smartest way possible. Sure. And if she says, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to say, that's okay. That's amazing. Where, where else can I help you go? What else can I help you learn? Right. So in my, in my past in history in tech, um, some of the companies I'm involved with, we helped develop some applications for that industry in the adult industry. And, you know, it's a very intoxicating industry, especially when, when women get involved in, you know, strip clubs and gentlemen's clubs, which I think is a stupid term because what, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there what, aren't very many gentlemen there. Yeah, <laughs> what kind of gentleman is in a club like that? But anyway, um, you know, it's intoxicating because some of those, those women that are in those situations are making serious bank, you know, serious they, bank. Yeah. Yeah. They, they can make a, a lot of money. And so, you know, some people will, will project this, oh, that's, that's the easy way, or that's the wrong way. Well, you know, 
I think that that's a, it's a luxury to look at it that way, to think that these women choose this path is, um, is the wrong way. That, that person who's telling them that it's the wrong way must have a, a really nice background or a daddy who's willing to pay their bills for them to have other options, mm-hmm. you know, and then they, and then like, their argument might be, well, why can't you just wait tables and, and, you know, do right under God's eyes or whatever. Well, right. waiting tables. Okay. She could wait. She could have three jobs. She could be juggling three waitressing jobs and still you know? not be there yeah. and, and be, yeah. And, and be the best paid waitress at all the places and still not make what she's going to make as a dancer. And she's probably not going to gain the confidence. She might like be uh, the best balancer. She might be able to carry 17 plates on her hands. But I will tell you that stripping or, or being naked on camera or, or being in, in that industry somehow can give somebody a lot of confidence that women who I have coached do not have. They don't have the body confidence. They don't have the little uh, tools of the trade, little tips. Um, that can take them into the bedroom feeling really fierce, like tapping into their inner vixen. Like, I know I got it. That's why, I don't know if you remember this a few years back, maybe more than a few years back, 10 years back, it all becomes a blur after a certain age. Um, Pole dancing became like a trendy thing for housewives and good girls to do. Oh yeah, yeah. You saw saw all kinds of people installing poles in their basements or their bedrooms or, yeah, that was a huge trend. And that, and the idea, yes, it's great exercise, but the idea was also to, for the, for it to uh, assist the, the common woman, you know, in getting her sexy on. Well, yeah. no s- stripper, <laughs> you know, needs to do that. Sure. She knows she's got it. So sure. she has a certain power wherever she goes, whether or not she wants to exude that power, she's got it. And there's something to be said for that. So is it, again, man's brain here, okay, and it's not, it's not going down the wrong path. Is it intoxicating or a feeling of power when you have that sort of power over a man? Um, I, I wouldn't call it a, for me personally, I wouldn't call anything that I experienced a power over a man. It was a power okay. over myself. It was okay. a power over my, my insecurity. It was, uh, it, it provided me with esteem. Um, I know I learned very early, uh, what kind of, what kind of woman men fantasized about. I knew how to be the dream girl. Mm-hmm. very early there are women coming to, to me people like me like i don't understand i'm the boss of everything i have everything that i want but no man wants anything to do with me you know or, or i can't hold a relationship like why can't i keep a guy when i have everything else going on and i know the secrets to that and i think that's something that women in this industry they, they understand how to be that woman that who's pursued whereas women who have never had who have never touched that industry are completely lost with that and and need a little guidance um sure. if that's what they want for themselves so, well I, I guess it's maybe not power over somebody but to be able to kind of con- be considering like an intoxicating or um enjoyable feeling that you have that type of influence uh, on behavior some for men you know understanding what they're attracted to because, you know, let's face it, you know, you give a man an option to have sex, man, he'll drop anything you can think of to do that. Right. I mean, and it's, it's, it's a major part of um, men's makeup and, and that's not that women don't. Okay. But men are a little more forward with that. And, you know, there's, I'm in marketing, do a lot of work with people and they talk about, there's really only three motivators for any type of sales. One is more money. One is more power. And one is more sex. And because those are all mar- those are all things that motivate people. So I would think it'd be sort of interesting because I've never had this, you know, I got a face for radio, right? So um, <laughs> even though even though I was a football player and stuff in college, I, I still have a face for radio. And so I don't know what it would be like to have a mesmerizing effect on another human being. I, I mean, there are amateur nights like every Thursday. You should just pop into one. You might you might have more news uh, than you know. Oh, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> Don't even go there. Don't even go there. Okay. Uh, All right. So I, I, how I, long did you work in the Playboy circles? 
So um, I was there for about four years and until okay. 2006. And this is what I heard. Um, I was already really pushing my limits, my, my comfort level. Sure. Um, and uh, the network was going through some changes. And um, I heard this, Val, we'd have more work for you if only you were willing to get dirtier. And uh, I went, I'm out, man. I can't do this. I don't want, I, I, I'm already uncomfortable. I can't do more. Um, okay. So let me stop you for a second. Sorry for the interruption. Um, you were raised in a very con Christian, conservative, conservative values and stuff. Uh, did you carry forward that, um, you know? Well, I mean, every, every, everybody has their core values that they were given when they were grown up. Some people will basically divorce those or, or shutter them or get rid of them. And then some people have those. But I'm assuming because of your conflict that maybe um, your perspective was a little different on that. I wasn't as e as at ease with this work as some of the other women were. Sure. I definitely asked them a lot. I feel so naive looking back on it. No, so naive. There were a couple of women. I was like, do your parents know that you do this? What do you tell them? And you're like, you know, sure. it was such, a, such a juvenile question to ask. Like, who is this little girl who cares about what her parents think? Um, yeah, I, I did a lot of. It forced me. My choice to survive mm -hmm. or do what I was told was the right thing. Uh -huh. I, I was, I was faced with those and okay. I chose to survive yeah. and my choice to survive drove me to being more introspective than I already am. I I'm that by nature, but this, this forced me to really evaluate what am I doing? Why am I doing it? You know, what, what are these lessons that I think I know who taught them to me? What is driving them? Why did, where did they learn these lessons? Why are they doing that? How has it served them? Oh, you know what, maybe what, or what does this other culture think about it? Oh, that's a different perspective. Well, let's, let's bring these together. Let's deconstruct. So I, I had to, I had to really dig in. I had to ask why, where, how, be a journalist with myself about my own belief system, my own core values. And I grew tremendously from that. People don't like to question themselves. Sure. You know, they, they are spoon fed a, a set of beliefs and they go, yeah, yeah, that's it. Because that's what my parents told me. And of course my parents are right. I can't mm -hmm. question them. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, or of course, of course, my culture is right. I'm not going to go outside of my culture. They don't, they have a giant ego. Yes, I've learned what's right. I'm, the, I've done, I'm doing it the right way. Everybody else is wrong. And that's it. It's, that is a simple thing to do. That is that they don't want to challenge themselves. Right. So I had to do the hardest thing to do. Challenge myself, get inside my brain, get inside my soul, take it apart, put it back together, take it apart again, put it back together. And I, I, I am in such a, such a better place for that. And I, I really wish more people would do that. It's so incredibly important for evolving yourself, for society, everything. Okay. Yeah. So looking back, and you just talked about a few things in your, your time at Playboy and doing those things. What's the single biggest thing you learned? And then what's the biggest regret? Okay. Um, the, the biggest thing that I learned, I, I, I would say my greatest gain is confidence. Okay. I learned how to, I learned that I am okay and my choices are okay. And I need to not look to, I need, the answer is within me. God okay. is within me. Right is within me. And I'm not seeking attention and affection and um, acknowledgement from people who themselves are broken. Okay. Okay. We, we break more when we do that. And a lot of us are doing that. Sure. So I needed to learn how to get comfortable discarding the broken uh -huh. that I was sprung from and be whole with myself. So that was my greatest game. Um, what am I, what do I wish, um, I had done differently? I, I wish that I had been able to find this confidence before going through this professional experience. If I had been more confident that I, 
uh, that I really could have whatever I wanted, that I could find a way. Uh, if I had not had that negative self-talk in, in um, running through my head at the age of 19 you know, through 27, um, saying, I can't afford this, I don't deserve this, nobody will love me, nobody will accept me, I can't I can have what I want, I can't pursue what I want, screw it if my parents say, you'll never earn enough if you take this, sure. no, don't get a student loan because we'll never be able to pay it back. If I had believed in myself younger, I wouldn't have made those choices. And now I, I would have just pursued you know, some of the things that I ended up pursuing later in life um, after I met someone at 27 who was completely pivotal for me, like okay. just transformational for me. And he really helped bring, he helped me understand my value. Okay. Um, so like I found my sexy before him Okay. <laughs> but because I had my sexy, I guess, because I, because I had that power with me in the same room as him, I was able to form a relationship with him and he then gifted me with the knowledge of my internal value and my capability. Okay. Okay. So, um, mm. so there's that. <laughs> so another question that comes to mind and again, I, I just am full of these dumb questions that come up when I'm, when I'm talking to people is um, in that industry, do you think there's a lot of people that, because uh, validation is so important to us. Right. You know, we all want to be loved. We want, all want to be told we're okay. Um, do you think it's, uh, is a pervasive uh, behavior for a lot of people in the adult industry to seek out and want that validation? I know a lot of people in the adult industry and I, and I really think that it is um, for many people, it's, it's, there aren't a lot of other opportunities available for them sure. or there aren't a lot of other opportunities that are going to provide them with what they need. They come from very challenging backgrounds. Sure. Okay? So this is the best it's either this or clean up ketchup and ketchup isn't going to pay the bills. No, no. Okay. okay. Well, and, and, and validation is, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, and we'll talk about that a little bit in relationships and stuff because, you know, that's part of com effective communication is understanding what the real f feelings are. So I was just a guess on my part uh, to think well, that there's validation that comes with it. I mean, I remember being out at a, at a club of one of this was, a million years ago, a club one evening, and and two men approached me and asked me for my autograph. Hey, you're that girl on that show. I'm like, yeah. And that was that was such a cool experience for me. I went to New York when I was working as a host um, for Six Cetera. And I think I was walking by the water and, and a man was sitting on the bench and he goes, Oh, Valerie. And I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding? This is so cool. Um, so, uh, the, that recognition, um, felt like validation. I must be doing something right because not anyone can go somewhere and strangers rec recognize them. I must be doing something right. I must be doing sure. something cool, something that people want to see. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. I didn't, I didn't feel that before my time on TV. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. there, there is that. So you're with the Playboy organization for four years. What was your next hop? So I decided that I needed um, a, a big change and um, inspiration and maybe um, I could get that in New York. So I went off to New York. Um, an even I, more expensive place to live. An even more expensive place. Yeah. Yeah. This time I'm just being like masochistic. Like how much can I make it hurt? <laughs> That's know? right. And, and no risk, no reward. Um, so that's what I learned in New York through a hedge fund manager that I had a very toxic seven year relationship with. Um, so if any, if anyone wants to come to me as a coach and discuss toxic relationships and uh, surviving narcissism and, and find it, finding out how to uh, detect um, certain personalities uh, and, and avoid them like the plague, then uh, definitely give me a call because <laughs> I am, I have not just, uh, not just read about it, not just studied it, but I have been in it myself. And I think there's no greater teacher than experience. Sure. So, um, so there's that, um, New York, uh, introduced me to people who would then, uh, one person in particular who would very much empower me to, um, do the impossible, do what I never thought that I could do and, and go back to school. So I had been a college dropout for 10 years at this point, not okay. because I was, I wasn't good enough or I wasn't smart enough or I didn't it was just know. the economics. Right? Yeah. And, um, that changed after him. 
And so at, I think, 28, I decided to go over to the UK okay. um, and, and uh, complete my bachelor's degree. And then I was such a good student and I loved being a student so much when I was able to step away from everything else and just focus on being a student, which mm -hmm. I would have loved to have done at 18, but I just sure. couldn't do it. Um, just focus on being a student, focus on doing something that I love and nourishing my brain and my soul with, with knowledge and creativity. Um, I, I succeeded at it and I went and got a master's degree. And Fantastic. so, yeah, so I finished my bachelor's <laughs> at um, University of Middlesex, which is in uh, North London. And that was in um, creative and media writing. Okay. And, and I went to uh, Sussex, which I think uh, until recently, until Megan and Harry uh, was was a name that very, very few people knew of. But um, that's South England, um, uh, Sussex University. And I, I got a master's in uh, critical writing, which is essentially which is theory. Um, sure. Right. And and there's more. Um, there's more coming up, which I'm super stoked about. I'm not quite ready to, to um, you know, discuss the details of that yet, but uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see how life has changed for me. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't, I, I think it's, it's so fascinating for me to see what we can do when we open our minds and take a deep look in ourselves and believe in ourselves. Yeah. Um, I am a, a, a work in progress and I'm, and I'm coming along great. And I, I really um, am excited to help other people find that within themselves too. You know, I, I want to help you, you and your listeners be a work if that, if they're ready for that. You know, I, one thing I look back at my college experiences and most of it has to do with age. You know, I was a football player and um, I know that I would have had a deeper education experience if I wasn't really majoring in beer drinking, <laughs> goofing around and chasing girls, you know, and football, you know, cause that was my life. So I can see that when you return to school later, that, that the experience is deep and you're more focused, you have confidence, you, you know, you approach a professor and do these things. You don't have those fear, uncertainty and doubt as you're going through that, you know, college experience as a young person. I think that the American education system is, is very backwards in so many ways. And one of those ways is that we really need to take a gap year, or yep. I would say even two gap years, like they do in the UK. And I, and I believe in Europe too, definitely in the UK, um, go get some life experience. Mm -hmm. And if you need to drink your face off, you do it then and not yep. when you're a student and the goal is to get, you know, straight A's or yeah, get that out of your system. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've always recommend, recommended for my kids to go away. I don't want you within a hundred miles of my house because mm -hmm. once you go become adult, right? I want you to go do those things. And, you know, there's lots of ways people do that. You take that gap year or like in Israel, you know, everybody that uh, when they get the, after graduating from high school, everybody goes in the army, right? Yeah. So, you know, those types of experiences really do polish people a lot. Okay. So after you got your master's, what was next? Well, then I came back and I started uh, coaching. I, I okay. didn't really know what to do after I, I wrote my thesis. Um, and, and somebody reached out to me and said, you know, I, you have so much experience. You should coach. And I went, gosh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Like, you don't really need to know what to do. You have it. You have it within you. So I just, I went, okay, let's see what happens. I'll establish a business and I'll, and I'll learn as I go. And that was mm, 2014. Okay. When, when that happened. So, um, I, so far so good. I've definitely stumbled along the way. Um, there are moments where I, I, I suffered imposter syndrome and, um, you know, there have been, there have been moments where I've, I've been completely caught off guard and I didn't know how to work with somebody's issue that they came with, but I do love a challenge as you might have <laughs> gathered Sure. You know, going to LA, going to New York, um, uprooting, go, moving going across to the UK. Yep being a, a student 10 years older than everybody else. Um, I do like a challenge. Uh, if we're not challenging ourselves, we're not growing. So, um, so it, it, it has been challenging, but I've learned, I've laughed a lot. Um, I've polished my act and um, it, doing that has taken me to um, the next step that I'm, I'm very, very excited about. Okay. So let's talk about what you really coach people on and what you're teaching at this point in time. Okay. Um, so well, let's, let's dive in there a little bit. Sure. So I've heard, um, 
I've encountered all kinds of things. So I, I, my title is intimacy, intimacy coach, right? And so I will help a relationship. I'll help people in relationships, couples, I'll help individuals. Um, I help with erotic issues. Um, I have, uh, I help with dating. There are so many things under intimacy mm-hmm. that I've encountered. Um, what I find that it all, most of it boils down to is confidence and communication. Okay. It, it almost always comes down to issues uh, with confidence and communication. So um, a lot of couples will, let's say sex is always a problem. Okay. After sure. you know, let's five years, you know, things are different and you might still be attracted to your partner. You might still have love for your partner. Um, maybe they're a great, um, a, a great parent, a great roommate, a great friend. Uh, but it's just kind of, it's not the same, you know, things have become routine. Sure. Mundane. Um, and, and so sex is lacking and it's not because she's dried up or he's fallen off. It's not because there's something wrong with either one. It's not mm-hmm. necessarily because there's no attraction. It's because there's been a communication breakdown and we can't figure, we can't talk about what we're feeling at this point, somehow we're afraid of being judged. Um, We're afraid of hurting the other person's feelings. We're afraid of revealing ourselves too much. You know, ironically, we don't want to be too vulnerable with our partner. The the one that we're supposed to be the most vulnerable with, the one that we're supposed to be the most fearless around. We have built up all this fear. Um, So um, we, we need to learn to speak again. Um, there is a way to do it. There is tact. And I think that, uh, having a better grasp of language, um, by having a better grasp of language, um, we can enter these situations with a lot more confidence to speak honestly, transparently, uh, Mm -hmm. with our partners. And that will, that will help us with our issues. There's a lot of sweeping under the rug and, and that can't, we can continue to do that if we want to continue to suffer, if we want to continue to be uncomfortable, if we want the problem to, to increase, then keep sweeping. But sure. if, if you want to uh, repair, we have to learn to use our words. Okay, so let me ask you a question again. These just crazy trains cross my mind. And, and I like no, nothing to do with Ozzy Osbourne. Okay. So, <laughs> um, just trying to learn. Do you see the confidence issue be more pervasive or trend that's in the different sexes? So are women more issues with confidence? Are men? Do you see that in your work that there is one of the sexes that has more challenges with confidence? Yes, I have definitely, um, been approached by more men than, than women with confidence issues. Um, really? M- more men? More men. <laughs> Surprise. I know. Holy my smokes. I would have I thought the other way. I mean, cause you know, Hey, I'm 55, been around the block a lot, kind of experience and stuff. And at this point in time, I am who I am. Right. And I'm, you know, I change things and I'm, you know, that kind of stuff. But sort of am who I am. And I, I know what I can do. You know, I would have just guessed it would have been more uh, females that are insecure about, you know, gravity takes over over certain years and that has impacts on women's bodies. And um, then if they've had a few children, then you're dealing with, you know, the, the children, you know, pouch and those types of things. And so, you know, I don't know. I'm just guessed. I'm just sort of bla- blown away that it would be more men. Well, I can talk, I can tell you what each, each um, has expressed insecurities about. Okay. Um, so with women, I would say their insecurities uh, are based on being cheated on. Okay. How do I keep my partner from cheating on me? Sure. How do I know if he's a cheater? You know, how, how do I make sure that I own him and that he belongs to me and that I'm good enough to keep his eyes entirely on me? Okay. Um, confidence. Uh, how do I meet the right kind of man? I'm ready to, to level up. You know, I, I want to step it up a notch. I, I'm meeting, you know, children. 
And now I'm ready to meet men and I'm not sure how to do that. How do I present myself? That's what I'm hearing from women. Uh, there was also, I, I have encountered, a, you know, what about a postmenopausal, you know, how do I find uh, my eroticism uh, postmenopause? Sure. With, with yeah, men, especially, especially with estrogen levels, you know, you know, going all way haywire, maybe not having as much, uh, much testosterone in the systems that they used to have. I mean, poor women, when they go through that life change, that really messes a lot of things up. It's, it can make things um, more challenging. It doesn't necessarily have to destroy uh, sexuality or eroticism or a relationship, marriage. Okay. Um, it can definitely make things more challenging, at least for a while. Um, so yeah, the, the body, bodies can change, but they can snap back too. I'll tell you, one of the smokinest babes I ever met was a woman in her forties who had two teenage kids. She was a, uh, she was a former, um, what was it? Swedish bikini team model. Okay. And she had two kids when she was young and she worked, she worked hard to maintain her bikini team model physique. And she was rock solid in her forties and gorgeous. So mm -hmm. it can happen. Um, there are, um, Change, there are other changes in the bodies that there are you know, surgeries or lasers for sure. some of my girlfriends have benefited from. Um, so, you know, there are the pills and the lotions and all the, po the potions and tonics. Um, there is work that's involved. Um, okay. but there are also, I would say the main thing is uh, the frame of mind changes for women. Sure. So now they're focused. They want, they're focused on being mothers. Sure. Right. So and and motherhood is the hardest job. Um, it is the most demanding job. It never stops. And they're so exhausted from being, from playing this role that when do they have the time to put any energy into reversing, going back to that sort of honeymoon phase sure. that they had with their, with their partner. Okay. Um, so, so go ahead. And also by the time you, the children come into a relationship, there's a lot of, uh, there's the potential for a lot of resentments to be built up. There's the potential for over familiarity to be built up. Now I love Esther Perel. I'm a disciple of um, psychotherapist Esther Perel. She is um, famous for her couples counseling and specific. Um, and I, she says something I, I'm, I can't, I'm not quoting verbatim. I think, but desire requires mystery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. And, and if you're living, if you're living with someone, you know, by the time you've had kids with them, there are probably zero secrets. There's probably zero. You've, you have seen the best of them, but you've also seen the worst of them. Sure. And it can be really, really challenging to, you know, after discovering that about your partner, um, go back to that time where there was a little bit more of an erotic veil. Um, so, so it's a lot of it's psychological too. Sure. And then men are, men are, are often the ones to point out you know, my part, there's something wrong with her. Why can't she be more sexual? Why don't we get a cream for her? Because I want sex and she doesn't she mismatch libidos. It's all her fault. They're also, they're not exactly helping by, they're not exactly helping because they're not being, you know, that there's a saying that's attributed to Gandhi. I think, you know, be the change you wish to see in the world. Yep, yep. Well, I think that we should, we should, um, that can be applied to intimacy as well. You know, be the person you wish to um, bang in the world, you know, <laughs> like be, be the change you want to see in your relationship. If you are looking, uh, if you are looking for your partner to be sexier, mm -hmm. start with yourself first. If you want um, to be more erotic, you create that erotic situation first. If you want to feel more seduced, you start the seduction. It, you know, so so there, there's a lot of pointing fingers, mm -hmm. and we need to work on ourselves. Be the person you would want to be with, and you might find that your partner, even though there are all these barriers and obstacles, now she might or he might. Uh, be a little more interested in, in what's in front of them. Respond. So dialing in a little bit, just because I'm a man and I was curious about this. 
what are the um, issues around, what, what confidence issues do men have? I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about women for a minute. What, do, uh, what confidence level issues do men have? They, uh, men are nervous to approach women. They think that they don't know what to say. Um, they think that they're not going to have it in bed. Mm -hmm. Um, I I would say that those are, those are the top two. Those are on the script. You know, I don't know what to say to women. I'm not really sure what comes next. How do I approach her? How do I even break the ice? What if she turns me down? And then if I get an opportunity to, to be with her, what if I'm not big enough? What if I don't last long enough? You know, what if she does something and like, it's, so it's, um, sexual performance and, um, conversation confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I don't even, uh, relate to the first one very much. (laughs) Um, because you can imagine that somebody that does a podcast will, you know, since I was just a kid, I'll, I'll talk to anybody, you know, and I, you know, I don't have any issues of walking up to anybody that's a complete stranger because I've just learned that people are people and just engage in a conversation. So that's not something I've struggled with. And I, I think there are certain men out there that, that have that type of personality. That My guess is that you are a very good listener. So you're not in your head thinking about what do I say next to look good or mm-hmm. to look good or to come across as, as a great conversationalist. You're actually hearing, you're pausing. There's, there's nothing, you're in a meditative state when somebody else is talking to you and you're just taking it in, right? And, and you're, you're, look, you're taking in all of the stuff that they're saying to you and, and, you're going off what is said to you, you know, you're creating your next sentence based off what you're receiving rather than what you're predicting. Okay. So maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Is it a meditative state for you or how would you describe it? No, it's just a fearless state. <laughs> I'll, I'll, say any, I'll just say anything to anybody. I mean, I, I talk to people at the grocery store about something stupid or, Hey, what, what's that? Or isn't, doesn't this suck or something? So I, you know, and it doesn't matter male or female, I'll just, you know, make comments. And so, I don't really um, deal with, uh, and I, because I've, in my career in sales and marketing and tech and stuff, I've met, I meet so many people a year and it just, you know, rejection is not that big of a deal on initial conversations because so what, you're just another person, right? You know, there's another one around the corner to talk to about X, Y, and Z. Now, I think probably one that a lot of men struggle with is, actually just asking for sex because you know that's especially when you get into a marriage and a relationship that's you know longer and those types of things and you do associate at least i have over years of you do associate um acceptance and love based on asking for sex okay and so maybe i'm just a weirdo here and and that's there but it's a form of rejection. And I know for a lot of men, especially when you start that conversation, you know, trying to start the conversation, rejection can be paralyzing. I mean, it's absolutely paralyzing for so many men because it's like, whoa, I don't want to crash and burn when I make a comment or say something or those types of things. But my, my issue downstream has just been, oh man, you know, I've been in this relationship for a long time and I, hell, I don't want to have to ask for that. I want that sort of to flow a little more. But when you've been in a relationship for five, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever, um, things tend to get, I wouldn't say they're not as much stale. It's just um, part of the relationship to change. And I'm not going to go as far as to say it's marital obligation, but certainly it's something you ask for because now there's just a lot of things going on. I think it's interesting that, that you, that you call it asking for sex. When I hear I'm asking for sex, I hear a partner potentially res- feeling that she's responding to something that's obligatory, a duty. Yeah. When you ask for something to be done, it becomes a duty. You don't, you, you want to create um, an environment. Um, you want to create a, a sense of want in them rather than obligation. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so what are you doing? I would ask you, what are you doing to, to give her what, she, what does she need? Have you had a conversation, babe? What is it that you want? And, and not even like sexual, not like what position do you want? Because I do, think, I do think that men tend to go straight for 
those kind of things. And sure. that can be frightening for women, but what mm-hmm. would, what would help you feel relaxed? What, how, what can we do to connect? What can we do to engage and sure. leave it at that? I, chances are, if she feels really connected and engaged and relaxed with you, the sex will unfold naturally. Sure. And it's important to remember that sex doesn't necessarily mean penetration. I mean, sex can take a lot of forms. Sure. I think I think that you know w- when we graduate, you know, high school or college, we sometimes forget that there are so many other forms of sex that are so so very hot. Yeah. Um, and um, those can be really nice to enjoy too. So mm-hmm. if, if the goal is always to have penetrative sex or your know, penis and vagina, then, then we need to get out of that because sure. we're missing a lot in eroticism. But uh, yeah, have, I, this might be too personal, but I, I would ask, have you said, how can I help you relax? What do you need around here? That, uh, what do you need from me that would help you feel more connected to me? Yeah, I guess, you know, it's one of those things. I think when you look at, uh, marriages that last, you know, a long time. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not so much to kiss and tell, but I want to just, you know, say the fact that there's so many complex issues that are going on, right? So, so, so you've got, you've yeah. got work related stress, you've got kid related stress, you've got, um, all of these things that, um, you basically, um, are dealing with and, um, you really want to be, it's hard sometimes to separate those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, worried about a bill, you know, are my kids okay at school? Something that happened, you know, at, at, you know, in a social situation, worried about, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so those things can often occupy, you know, thoughts, and then there's really not the ability to sometimes to unwind that because you've probably seen those videos and I don't remember who the doctor was that talks about it, how men are really good at compartmentalizing things, right? All right, let's just, here's sex and let's just do that. And it has nothing to do with issues around worrying about kids or jobs or money or, you know, fat or whatever it happens to be, right? But women, that's all kind of intermixed and, and intertwined and all connected. And so I think sometimes when we get on, in, you know, when life gets more complex, because when you're single, don't have kids, things are a little simpler, right? Mm-hmm. And so I guess it's the question is, is, you know, so how do, how do, and I'm not saying it's only women, but I'm, I'm, I guess it's, is how do we basically unclock from those things, unhitch from those things and be in the moment? Yeah. So it sounds to me that it, you were saying uh, men uh, can can compartmentalize uh, mm-hmm. differently than women can. And when, when you want sex, you just want sex and it doesn't have to be attached to anything. Let's just go. And to me, that sounds like what you need when you're looking just to pop quickly and get it over with, you might as well just go to the gym, you know, just lift some weights. The, what you're looking for is a release of energy. Sure. So that is not, that's not connection. That's not intimacy. That's not sexuality. That's a release of energy. Just go to the gym and, and get it over with if, if that's what you're what you want, um, uh, or if that's you know what you need to release. Um, it, imposing on your female partner if, if she also isn't after that quickie. If she right. also isn't after like, babe, let's just get that. We've got ten minutes. Let's get this done. And um, if that's not her mind frame, you bringing that to her is most likely going to push her away further. She's going to remember this and it's going to become, it's going to make all this stuff that's already in her head more complicated. Yeah, it goes back to objectification and I just hear for that, except like that. However, that's not always the case. Right. No, a lot of men are not very good at communicating that they need that connection. Yes. That, you know, because men still do, you know, women often more frequently, I guess, just guessing here, want and need that connection and intimacy is more about the intimacy and that connection than it is the physical act. Now, a lot of men, speaking from certain experiences is, wow, I still want that connection and I still want that intimacy. I still want that intimate moment that's just between a couple. You know, there's that unspoken language that you connect with your partner and you just want that. 
but it also includes it also in most cases includes the sexual activity and yeah. most cases because it's you know part of the whole complete picture it includes intercourse okay so um you know i i think i would guess that a lot of women might think if the husband partner is pushing for that they might only want the quick hit okay but I can tell you more times than not, it's a combination. I still need that release, I need that connection, that intimacy, but it's more frequent than maybe she wants to participate in. Yeah, I've heard this before. Uh, many women will say, oh, men are such pigs. They all they want is sex. And, and it's not sure. all they want. Yeah, sometimes that's what they want. But a lot of times they are looking for a connection. They're just not really in tune with themselves. And they don't know how to, uh, they don't know how to articulate. Like, I actually really want this attention from you. I want to feel desired. I want to feel heat. I want to feel alive. I want to feel like you're interested in me. Wanted, so, needed. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I want to take a moment away from the bills, the kids, the nagging, the whatever. I want to just pause that for a moment and go back to that and go back to that, uh, that time where we were a bit more carefree and had more attention and more for each other. Sure. Um, so well, and, and just that, that connection in that space in the universe where you're just lost in your partner, you yeah. know, you're just lost in them. You're lost in magical escape. That, that magical escape, the passion, the heat, the, you know, urgency, all of those things. And it's a, you know, it's a delicate place to be because it's something that you just desire because that's a connection that you have with your partner that you don't share with anybody else, or at least you mm -hmm. hope you don't share with anybody else. And so that is such a desired state. For, some people do people. actually, I can say that can be some, some pretty intense erotic fuel for some couples to, to know that their partners are being shared. Just, just throwing that in there. <laughs> hey, there's different strokes, different folks, different, you know, I'm never going to value and you judge that. Okay. So uh -huh. you so go ahead. First, first, I would say learn to, if, if, um, you're one of the men listening who, uh, wants these things but have it hasn't expressed hasn't expressed um these things to your partner try that try articulating differently to ask yourself what is it that i really want why do i want this you know what am i missing mm -hmm. and then find a gentle delicate tactful way to express that to your partner not so it asks like i want i need to give to me but i miss sharing this with you okay do you remember when we had this do you miss that? Was that nice for you? That was so nice for me. I'd love to reconnect in that way. So that's the way we communicate um, is massively important. And if you if we can do it the right way, we're going to have a, a psychological impact on, on our partners. Also, I think it sounds like um, you might want to take Rex, you might you might want to make a commitment to have a, it doesn't need to be called a date night if that if your partner um, sure pressure from that but some time to relax with your partner like once a month go some go take a staycation yeah. and make sure that everything is aligned so like everything is lined up you've got the nanny or the family watching out for your kids the bills are paid or you have someone paying them off for you you know sure. everything is done or somebody's taking care of the things that need to be done so you can not not worry yeah about don't don't bring all those stresses into the environment not you have to make the promise to to leave that behind at least for 24 hours and just focus on each other and again I, and i heard what you're saying you would like um you would like sex you you would like uh like a traditional like a, a penetrative sex ultimately um and i think that uh, it's not wrong to want that but again, I do think it's it's very important to um, remember um, sensuality and playfulness, sure. and to make that your priority when you have when you have this twenty four hours or forty eight hours or whatever it is that you promise to take with your partner, all stressors removed. Um, make it playtime, not sex time. Right. Make it playtime. Make it sensual time. Um, and, and I think that you will find that 
the sex follows. And it might not be the first time you do this if you're not accustomed to doing this. It might take a few weeks, it might take a few months, but as your partner becomes more relaxed and Mm -hmm. trusts you and Mm -hmm. you can reconnect with that old space that used to be in, I think she's she's going to um, unfold a little bit better than than you've seen. Um, um, Also, one thing that I know that turns women off a lot, female partners to their men is, that men are rushed. It does feel like an exercise. There's not sure. a lot of breathing. There's not a lot of eye contact. There's not a lot of connection in there. Um, they get the, um, maybe they've been watching a lot of porn because they don't get a chance to connect as much as they want to. They don't get intimate time with their partner as much as they want to. So their intimate time, the, the only sex that they get is what they're watching from the screen in, in the dark uh, room in the basement, sure. you know, when in that you know, when in that rare moment that the kids aren't, kids aren't screaming or whatever, they, they, they see porn and porn tends to be really, um, you know, it's over the top. Um, it's violent in many cases. It is definitely uh, objectifying and it's all about the man getting his pleasure in oftentimes very aggressive ways. Yeah. And, um, boy, so that, then- that's another show in, in, in its entirety. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, then- yeah, go ahead another show well we can do it yeah yeah the one thing that um i know as an internet marketing guy one out of six clicks on the internet's for porn yeah yeah so it's a it's a huge huge industry it has all kinds of psychological effects it drops into addictions and just horrible types of behaviors that happen to break up marriages and all kinds of stuff and so yeah that's another that's another conversation for another day but you know, I think one of the things that a lot of people probably struggle with, I know I have in past histories and stuff is, um, I don't think, and again, again, com- completely wrong. I, I think a lot of men probably struggle with the vulnerabilities because one of the reasons, you know, we're taught from when we're little kids, you know, men are, be tough, be strong, be the man, you know, fall down, pick yourself up, wipe off the dust, you know, wipe the nose off, you know, the blood off your nose and and get back in the game. And I think there's a level of vulnerability that a lot of men don't confront when they're trying to communicate about sex or intimacy with a woman, because then it makes you might feel like, oh, am I, am I fully being a man here? Am I doing these things? And I think a lot of men, because everybody's exposed to it from pornography, they see that rough environment that men you know, dominating environment and those types of things. And I think it's pretty hard for a lot of men to go to that vulnerable, vulnerable place. Yeah. Don't bring porn into the bedroom. Porn is not real sex. Porn is not sex education. It is, it is um, rough and tumble fantasy. And I think it does more of a disservice to us than it does a service. I don't think that it's inherent. I don't think that it's always bad. But I, I do think that people do not have enough media literacy to understand what it is they're seeing. Sure. And they're going to take what they think they're seeing, bring it into the bedroom and further destroy their relationships. So unless you have, a, if you want to watch porn with your partner and discuss what you're seeing and what do you like, what do you not like? Would you like to try this together? Oh, why, why does this turn you off? Why does this turn you on? That's great. That can be a bonding moment. That could be a moment of connection. That sure. can turn into something spicy then or later or not at all. Doesn't matter. But that's a great way to connect with your partner if he or she is open to that. But don't watch it on your own and then go like assume no. that the person that you're with wants to be choked until she vomits. <laughs> you know, like, that's not cool. You yeah. have more, more issues than you're already encountering. Um, and, and it is, don't forget to ask, ask yourself, you know, as I was saying earlier in the podcast, I had to learn because I was faced, I was between a rock and a hard place and I had to choose to survive. And because of what I did to survive, I had to learn to question myself and my beliefs. Do that with your sexuality, with your desire for eroticism. Don't just say like, uh, I need this, go get meat. Or like, yeah. wh- what, what is it? that I'm feeling. Be your own therapist. Sure. Um, what am I feeling? What are all of the things that are going through my body? What are the things that are going through my mind? When I have this feeling, what do I associate it with? What emotions am I feeling? 
You know, what am I missing? When did I last have that with my current partner? Sure. Uh, when did she feel that? Is there something that, that, um, sh- that we shared together that made me feel this way that she could remember fondly? Yeah. And, and so that brings her into the, that conversation that you're going to have with her. Once you've sorted out what it is you're going through, that brings her into the conversation. It becomes a shared conversation, a shared moment, not a demand. You know, like, babe, what about us? Remember this? Mm-hmm. Um, I think she's going to, if you're not accustomed to saying, I feel, I would, I would like to have this with you. Um, if you're not accustomed to being empathetic to her needs and what drives her, okay. um, and then you have that conversation, she's going to, her panties might melt a little bit. <laughs> She'll go, what? <laughs> well, that's a straightforward description. That's for sure. So let's talk for a minute. Uh, I mean, you've just been amazing. There's so much to unpack because it's such a big issue. You know, it, gosh, it only impacts just about everybody over like 18. And, you know, you would hope that, you know, younger people would not be doing so much of that because they can't handle the emotional side of all that. But, but that's another whole discussion. But <laughs> when people are engaging you for your coaching, your teaching, uh, your writings and stuff, what, what does that look like? Is it a certain amount of time that you work with somebody, a number of sessions? Tell us what that looks like when they want to connect with you and get the help that you can offer. Okay. Well, um, they can buy sessions. Um, so I have found that the, the people who are more inclined to buy sessions are uh, people who have, um, who want help overcoming their you know, insecurities, their uh, confidence issue guys. Like how do I, how do I go out and uh, meet people? What kind of conversations do I have? So we'll have mock dates. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll have conversations like they would have, we'll text like they would, they would text somebody that they're meeting to get more comfortable with things and explore things before they go out into the real world and do it. Okay. So those are generally um, uh, package packages. Um, if you aren't ready to commit to a package, um, I definitely offer uh, individual sessions and you can just okay. go, you know, as you're comfortable. Um, so that was, that- that's what I was trying to get to is, I mean, are you doing one-on-ones and individual coaching? Do you have self-service type, you know, programs where people dump into a, you know, kind of a subscription and get access to the lots of I've been data? thinking about, I've been doing a lot of restructuring this past year has given me some time to think about how I might want to, you know, to change, um, create sure. changes and, and newness. And um, that has definitely been on my mind a lot lately. Okay. Uh, just w- access, access the package whenever you're ready. Um, I don't necessarily have to be there. You know, everything is pre-recorded. Everything is written okay. down. Uh, I, I would like to introduce that in, in the future. That's um, good. but it's still sort of in development right in now. Development. Um, it's, uh, I was using Skype. Um, there is also zoom now. I mean, pre sure. but now there's zoom. Um, uh, phone calls. I'm still very much in, into old fashioned voice conversations. I think that's, there's a nice warmth to that, that we're missing. Um, a lot of people are missing. They don't want to be, um, they don't want to pick up the phone. Um, but there is that, um, I also do offer in-person sessions. Now I'm in Southern California, so obviously that's not available to everyone. Um, you know, and, and especially recently, um, sure. but things are opening back up. Um, okay. if you, if somebody, it happens to be here and they want to do it safely with masks on. I can, I can go and meet them. Sure. Um, that would be, you know, a couple hours, um, a zoom conversation could be an hour. Sure. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, remind us again, how do people get a hold of you? Okay. So my name is Valerie Baber. That's V A L E R I E B A B E R. And .com. yeah, that's your website and that's everything, right? So that is media. everything. All the social media, the website, the email. So okay. just, just say, Hey, Valerie Baber, and uh, I'll be there. Okay. So um, we will have you back. There's a lot more to unpack. There's several topics that I know that listeners, even if they don't want to, are going to be interested, you know, even though, wait, wait a minute. That's the wrong word. Not want to. <laughs> it's the word that they might, uh, they may not admit. Um, but I think it's interesting because you're coming from this from a different angle than probably most people who are therapeutic or coaching or those types of thing is the fact that you 
did have this adult industry background. You right. did experience the conflict and understand that. Luckily, you didn't go down some of the rabbit holes that exist there, you know, in that industry where you step across certain lines and get into porn and those types of things. And so I think it's an interesting perspective to be able to share with people because it does take a lot of confidence to do what you did. Okay. It is a different angle. And so I know there's a ton of people that are listening here around the globe that would love to have you back and we could do some other, you know, topics because, you know, it's a, it's a very important, um, conversation for people to have. Uh, they're very important techniques that they need to learn. And let's face it, you know, it's, it's three things that drive stuff in the world. It's more money, more power, more sex. And so uh, you do have a topic that's really interesting for a lot of people. That's right. And, and a topic that a lot of therapists will not um, address. And even if they will uh, address them, you know, maybe they're, they're very well read um, about how to discuss sex, but they just don't have the, the same kind of experience that I do. Um, sure. I am fortunate that as a coach, I also don't have the same sort of restrictions mm -hmm. as um, certain therapy, therapists do have. So I can be a lot more real. I can be more playful. Um, but I do want to say that I, I would like to distinguish because I know a lot of heads, a lot of heads are going to be turning when they hear this. Oh, she's had uh, an adult background. Oh, she's playful. Oh, she doesn't, she doesn't have the same restrictions. Oh, so uh, does she have a, a, what is it, a fans only or, or what kind of things do we do on Zoom? What kind of show is she? I don't do shows. I'm not an entertainer. I'm a coach and I'm here to help. I'm here to help individuals and couples grow. Uh, maybe, maybe in this case, I shouldn't even say that word, but become better um, partners. Sure. Okay, become more confident individuals. I, I am not here to, to uh, you know, there are certain things, if you're looking for that kind of entertainment, go to OnlyFans, don't come to me. So sure. it is, it's important to know that I do take this very seriously. And uh, my, my goal is to help. I get that. Well, thank you for coming on. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, I think you've got a lot to help people with. Uh, mm -hmm. You were very generous with your time today and your openness and your transparency. So that's great. And like I always tell people, there are too many interests for only one lifetime. So there's always another story around the corner. So thank you for sharing yours, your whole background that helps us understand how you got there. And thank you for sharing the opportunity that people can find you and, and get the help they might be needing. Thank you. I appreciate it. I yeah. look forward to, uh, to maybe speaking again about porn and, and hearing from your well, listeners who think that I'm I, not sure. I'm not sure that's the only topic, but I think there's a lot of stuff to unpack, but we, you know, we can't always do them in all one show. Right. So that's we'll get right. you back. Thank so, you so much for your time. Yeah. So we want to call it a wrap for today's uh, episode. It'll be up here shortly. We're recording this on the, in uh, March 9th at 21. So we definitely will get Valerie back on the show. So uh, just have a couple things to say. Don't forget as you are going out to subscribe to the channels, visit the website. You can go and learn a lot more about Valerie there and links to her uh, online assets and any of our listener and any of our guests. So until next time, I just have three things to say, which I always say, be safe, be bold, and make it a great day. <laughs>